Dr. Jennifer, Dr. Chu, thank you so much for joining us. It's an honor. It's an honor to be here. Thank you, Dr. Mo. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jennifer, let me start with you. Uh, in your practice as a clinical oncologist, you see cancer patients every day. What have you experienced in terms of a mental health impact on your patients? The mental health impact has such a significant role to play in cancer patients, but sadly, it is also almost often overlooked. Because when a patient is diagnosed with cancer, it is deemed as a life-threatening situation. So cancer takes priority in terms of treatment. As well as you know, cancer treatment is expensive. So mental health becomes a second priority. But this should change because we know that if we take care of patients in terms of their mental health alongside their cancer treatment, this can improve their treatment outcome. When you first tell a patient that they've been diagnosed with cancer, what sort of reactions do you see in clinic? So I think this is the toughest thing that I've ever done. Mm. And even after many years of being an oncologist, I think the toughest part about being an oncologist is breaking the news mm. to a patient. And often they come in with their family members and you can see fear on their face as well. Because there's a lot of things that, you know, when, when, when someone is diagnosed with cancer, um, it's as if the whole ecosystem changed. It comes to a halt, standstill. So I think as a physician, the best thing we can do to our patient is to be kind. Mm. Is to actually allow them time to accept and digest the diagnosis. And everyone copes differently. Right. Yeah. And we have to remember medicine is an art as much as it's a science. Exactly. We're not just treating the clinical part, but I think the mental part is as important. The whole human being. Uh, Dr. Chu, that brings me to you. When you first received your diagnosis, do you recall your initial emotional reactions? I think because I was so young, I was really shocked. That was my first reaction. And I think it's the same for my family members as well around me because what was meant to be H. pylori became cancer. Mm. So shock was the initial. Yes. And then later on in the um, coming days and weeks, did that turn into another emotion? I think it was, I think for me, because... I had um, a, de a PhD in psychology. I knew that I shouldn't be depressed. So it was from shock to like getting to know the determination to fight this. Mm. So it's from like zero to 10. Mm. How long did that take for you? I didn't have much time. So it took me seven days. Wow. Of course, in that seven days, I was crying before I was like fully diagnosed 100% with cancer, mm. waiting and for the biopsy results. And you're just in this limbo in those days. Yeah, I was just crying every day. Mm. It, was, it wasn't like sad crying, it was shock crying. Mm. Yeah. You know, that brings me to people around a patient, so families. Dr. Jennifer, what impact does uh, a diagnosis with cancer have on the mental health of the family system? Significant, I would mm. say. So we always focus on the patient, but actually we also need to look at the caretaker because it takes a lot of... Uh, mental, physical uh, toll on them, as well as financial stress. So all this comes in, and because we know caretaker plays the pillar of support for the patient. Right. So it's important as well as a physician, when they come along with the patient uh, for treatment, um, we include them as well in the decision making. Have you seen family members develop uh, things like depression or anxiety as a result of a... Absolutely. Yeah. I think if they look hard enough, and we make it consciously in our mind to actually engage them in the conversation every day with, during the clinic, we'll be able to pick up subtle signs mm. that perhaps shows that the caretaker is not coping very well with this situation, and that's when we offer help to intervene early. And have you seen situations where if the caretaker or family system is not coping well, that that actually has a negative impact? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. There's a negative impact on not just the, um, the whole holistic care of the patient, mm. as well as the communication breakdown, and patient may end up not being very compliant to treatment as well. So you have a tough job on your shoulders because you're breaking the news to the patient and the family, and then you're also trying to counsel all yeah. at the same time. And you're taking care of both the patient, the clinical part of it, mm -hmm. the emotional well-being, as well as then including the family into the whole equation. I want to come back to that in a bit because really it does take a village or a system of care. But coming back to you, Dr. Chu, what was your family reaction like when you first got diagnosed? You said you were very young. How old were you at the time? I was 27. 27. That's, and, that is quite young. Yeah. yeah. And I didn't have any family history of cancer. So it was definitely 
um, a shock to my family. My mom was a pillar of strength mm -hmm. because she was with me when I was doing my colonoscopy. And when a, the gastroenterologist walked in with my results, he was mumbling. I think he didn't know how to break it to me mm. because he already knew it was cancer because I guess they can see through, you know, while they were doing the scope. Uh, but he said that they sent it for biopsy. Right. But I knew biopsy meant it could be cancerous. Mm. So when he mentioned the word biopsy, I started crying. But my mom was surprisingly calm. She was like, it's okay. It's okay. And I forgot to take the medication with me while I went to the car. But when I messaged my dad, because he was in, uh, he was overseas at that point of time, he cried the whole night. Mm. So that was my parents. And my boyfriend at that point of time, he's now my husband. He just, he didn't know how to deal with it because it, it just came as a shock to everyone. You know, I've noticed that uh, as a practicing psychiatrist, that sometimes people around us don't have to have the answer, but mm. just crying with us or yeah. just being shocked with us really helps. Um, yeah. And that you just don't feel alone. I don't know if you've had patients where they don't have um, an extended support system. That feeling of loneliness, I think, is very impactful. Indeed. I think when you have family support, it, it shows a, a world of difference when it mm. comes to their treatment. Just, just by being there and, you know, yeah. like your mom having a listening ear. As well as sometimes I offer tips, because sometimes family members ask, what can, what can they do to help? Because yeah. sometimes you're speechless. You don't know what's the right word to say. Sometimes even saying something like, are you okay? Mm. May sound wrong. And, and so, so what I do is I offer them tips like offering physical help. Mm -hmm. So a lot of time, especially female patients, they be very worried about their children. Mm -hmm. So simple things like taking them to school, offering to fetch them back from school. Having a, a normal meal. routine. Yeah, and trying to offer some physical help means a, a lot of difference to these patients. Absolutely. You know, I, I want to talk about systems of care. <clears throat> and there's studies showing worldwide that there are barriers to mental health care within cancer treatment. How have you experienced these barriers in your practice? Yes. So, in Malaysia and possibly in a lot of part of the world, we find that a lot of patients are diagnosed at stage 3 or 4 cancer, uh, at an advanced stage of cancer. I think that's partly because of stigma. Mm. Yeah, Stigma prohibits them from coming early. Stigma pro prohibits them from wanting to know if it's cancer because they know the implication. They might need chemotherapy. Yeah. And so I think it's the same with mental disorder. Yeah. So there's a lot of stigma that revolves around this team. So we need to break this barrier have an open communication. And as a physician, we're the first person to reach out to the patient yeah. to tell them that it's okay. It's being brave and you recognize this early. And by intervening early, you can actually improve the disease outcome. Yeah. Dr. Chu, you were in a unique situation. You mentioned that you had training um, or you were at the time training in, in psychology. Yes. And, uh, but, you know, as a person working in mental health, we're not immune, we're human beings. Yeah. Was mental health support or care part of your journey and treatment? So the thing was, uh, I have to say my journey was a very lonely one because trying to find someone at, in their 20s having colorectal cancer in Malaysia is very difficult. And uh, I, besides my family and my friends, my friends can try as much as they want to support me and I really appreciate them for it. It's very different from someone I could relate to. So I did ask friends uh, for people they might know and my friend recommended me to a nun who was 80 years old who, mm -hmm. had, who was wearing a colostomy bag at that time and I was wearing a colostomy bag in between surgeries. And I just wanted someone to talk to but after talking to her, I realized that we're in a different age group, we're a different generation. So it was very difficult to relate because for me, I wanted to know what to wear. I know it's very shallow but... It's something very important to me at that point of time, my, how I look yeah. and how the colostomy bag would look when I go for meetings or when I go for, for things. And I still wanted to lead a normal life. So in terms of my mental health, I would say that I was always, I always remembered my training on how the rate of depression is uh, 50% to having cancer as well. The correlation is really high. So I always reminded myself uh, to get back up every time I had an emotional breakdown. Were there things you would do in your day-to-day -day life to help you get back up? I always try to keep to a routine of some sort. Mm. 
Uh, although I was really weak, I would try to walk at least. If I, once I started, when I was able to walk, I would start walking and I would read and ensure that um, when I'm able to fully like function, even with the bag, I wanted to still go for events and meetings. Right. Yeah. So having a routine, having a sense of meaning yes. and purpose, I purpose. think. Purpose. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you know, we talked about stigma earlier and how cancer stigma correlates with mental health stigma. Staying with you, Dr. Chu, um, we talked about this earlier. How have you experienced stigma with both the mental health aspect and the, the cancer diagnosis aspect? So before coming back to Malaysia, as I was studying in the States, I knew that in Malaysia, the mental health stigma is very real. And um, things like depression, anxiety, until today, I still hear people saying, oh, that person is just self-diagnosing. Hmm. It is probably fake. It, when a lot of people we know, for example, they say they have depression or they have anxiety, then a lot of others would question, but how do they know they have anxiety? Hmm. So that's the mental health part. Hi, my name is Anne Wilson. I am the head of public affairs and strategic partnerships for Beatrice. My role is to lead our partnerships with outside organizations like patient advocacy groups. We have a really wide portfolio, and that means that we get to touch patients across various parts of their disease journey. At Beatrice, we understand that when a patient is navigating a disease like cancer or MS, they are navigating so many other issues in their lives beyond just taking a medicine. And many of the partnerships that we support as an organization are focused on helping patients with those aspects, like treatment for mental health challenges, like anxiety or depression that may accompany a major diagnosis, like transportation to their physician's office, childcare while they are getting treatment, financial assistance when they have to stop working because the disease has become so burdensome. One of the things that I am most proud of is that as an organization, we are able to offer that support to these fabulous patient advocacy organizations who are in touch every day with patients who are suffering from many different diseases and who really understand the nuances of living well with the disease. One of the partnerships here in the United States that I'm most proud of is Beatrice's partnership with the Congressional Women's Softball Game. This is an event that is held every year and supports an organization called the Young Survival Coalition. YSC helps patients navigate everything from how to maintain your fertility during a cancer diagnosis to how to manage your financial obligations when you are in the prime of your career and often need to take time off of work to navigate a disease. The partnership that Beatrice has with the Young Survival Coalition is both professionally and personally important to me because my family has been impacted multiple times by cancer. My mother is a two-time breast cancer survivor and both of my sisters have the BRCA gene. One of my sisters, while undergoing surgery to remove her reproductive organs in an attempt to stave off any cancer, actually found out that she had ovarian cancer. They were lucky, they caught it very early, but she's a young mom who had to go through very aggressive chemo. The partnerships that Beatrice enters into with organizations like the Young Survival Coalition are even more meaningful now that I have seen my sister, who is a young mother, a young survivor of ovarian cancer, navigate a disease like that and the impact that it had on her family emotionally and financially. I want to come back to the advocacy in a bit, but coming back to you, Dr. Jennifer, um, when a person has a mental health aspect to their cancer care that's severe enough to warrant intervention, talk therapy or medication. Is that something you initiate? Is that something you have a team member initiate? So I usually refer them mm -hmm. to the specialist like yourself or a counselor to start with. And if a psychotherapy or medication is warranted, I'm full on with it. I'm on support with it. Mm. Yeah, because I think it's important that the patient gets 
the best help as early as possible. What I'll do is that I'll sit with my pharmacies and go through those drugs and see if it interacts with any of the targeted mm. therapy or immunotherapy or chemotherapy. Right. And that's basically just for best practice to make sure that the patient's safe. Yeah. What sort of reactions do you get from patients when you suggest mental health care? Do you get some people, you know, very accepting and then some think, why are you referring me to a doctor for uh, mental issues? Yeah. yeah, you get both end of it. Mm -hmm. So usually I think what's important is to establish that rapport with your patient. Mm -hmm. So my patient treats me like a friend. Right. So once you have break that barrier of communication, they're more willing to accept uh, whatever recommendation because you, they know that you have the best interest at heart. Yeah. So when I start saying that they can't cope well, there are subtle things, um, or family members offers history, like um, they're very short at family members, they're a little bit more withdrawn, because we must know that some symptoms um, may, may be overlapping with symptoms of, of their cancer treatment, right. or from their cancer. Fatigue, for example. Yeah, and, and so I think physicians also have a role to play to not just minimize these symptoms, and say it's partly because mm -hmm. of your cancer. Mm -hmm. fatigue, loss of appetite, lack of sleep, insomnia. So it's important to be able to differentiate those two and pick up subtle signs and, and then offer the patient this help. And a lot of time, my patients would be very happy to, to go for it, but there will be those who are refractory or they are fearful mm -hmm. because they are being labelled as needing to see a psychiatrist. Right. I mean, I think what you're talking about is so essential because when we talk about comorbidities across healthcare, not just mental health, mm -hmm. The debate is, do you treat sequentially or concurrently? Yeah. And I think because, as Dr. Chu said earlier, the mental health aspect can make the cancer diagnosis worse and vice versa. And so I think most studies show that treating concurrently makes a lot of sense because it, otherwise it can be a vicious cycle. Yeah, many studies have shown that if you treat concurrently, you can improve the disease outcome. Right. Improve patients' compliance to their treatment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and so that's why we advocate concurrent treatment and not sequential. And before we get into advocacy, do you, uh, um, do you advocate for active screening in patients? Do, I mean, do you wait until they say, I feel depressed or down? Or do a lot of clinical oncologists today actually do screenings for depression and anxiety early on? I think this effort can be stepped up. Mm -hmm. So it depends on uh, various practices. But I think moving forward, what we should do in modern oncology clinic knowing that um, mental disorders can be as high as 30%, which means 3 out of 10 patients that are sitting in front in our clinic could be harboring some mental disorders like depression and anxiety. So instead of waiting for these things to manifest or patients to just right. come to us, I think we can actually come up with a simple questionnaire mm -hmm. and have your nurses or even sometimes medical students mm -hmm. that are in training to actually distribute this questionnaire and get them to to answer them. Absolutely, something could be done in a waiting room and, uh, yeah. before coming in. And one in three is a huge number. So what, one of it's three huge. people that walk into my office might have this issue. It would be a shame not to detect it because that could make their whole treatment better. And just coming back to you, Dr. Chu, um, you mentioned advocacy earlier and how that's given you a sense of purpose and meaning, but also a community of support. Just walk us through that journey, how you got to this Young Cancer Survivors Group and the work you've done with them and what it's meant to you. So earlier I mentioned that for me, cancer was a very lonely journey. It was, um, although I had the support from my friends and family, it's very different from someone who has had cancer and in a way around my age group. So what I did was actually scour the internet and I found uh, a Facebook group, which was for young colorectal cancer survivors and patients, and it was in North America. So I joined the society they would invite me for conferences in North America. It was through them that I, they could understand me and I could understand them. Mm. They would make jokes and I could understand and laugh about it. Um, it's very funny. Only colorectal cancer patients would understand. But they talk about toilet paper. Mm -hmm. And I, I could laugh out loud because I understood exactly what they meant. And you felt understood. Yeah. yeah. And I could ask questions because that's all. I had so many questions I wanted to know and they would answer me. So this was the, the type of support that I could get from them. And it's through this support group, which I don't even know who they are. They don't know me because I'm in Malaysia and they're in North America. But I gained a lot of, I would say, determination to fight it and also a lot of information. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's how... Um, 
Let, that, that led me to the Young Cancer Survivors Group. Uh, under the auspices of the National Cancer Society of Malaysia, I told them I, I need to start a Young Cancer Survivors Group. And when I started it, there were some challenges because of the stigma and cultural taboo of cancer in Malaysia. Mm. But now, today, we have a group of more than 100 over people of different types of cancers. And... Um, when they first enter the group, they have so many questions. You can only imagine. But our challenges, the young cancer survivors, are very different from the other cancer support groups, which are usually mostly older. Mm -hmm. They are retirees. And they get to see each other every day. Mm -hmm. But for us, we don't get to see each other every day. Maybe once a month, and that's really trying our hardest to see each other once a month. But it's, it's through in the internet that we connect with one another, ask questions. And um, more importantly, is the support that we, we give each other through, the, through actually a WhatsApp chat group. And it's amazing use of technology too. Yeah. Um, because as you said, it's a different stage of life, young it people. Is. And you're doing all this, but you're also in this period of life where you're working, yes. trying to pay the bills. It, it is really a different challenge because in our age group, it's all about the others studying while getting treatment, mm -hmm. while also worrying about the finances and what their family members are feeling. And relationships. Yeah, and relationships. Some are thinking, can I get a boyfriend mm -hmm. for the girls who have ovarian cancer or cervical cancer? Right. So these are very legit issues and that they are questions. facing. Yeah. yeah, and they can they feel free and they, they can ask those questions in the group. And no one judges because we all understand one another. Like there are people in our group that they are afraid to get married because they are afraid that they might not be alive mm. maybe in a few years' time for their, for their spouse. And really, if you're not speaking to someone who's been through it, who can you ask that question to? Really, no one. No, no one. No one would get it. Other than maybe a healthcare team who's seen this yes. loss. But no one's experienced it unless they've been through it. And, no. Yeah. And you can only imagine how difficult it is to work, try to find the money to pay for your treatment, yet, yeah, thinking... Should I get married or should I even have a partner? So all these questions are actually what causes mental health problems, anxiety yeah. and depression. And has that work given you a sense of purpose and meaning? You, you mentioned you're a youth ambassador with the... Yes. So as the, the youth ambassador for the National Cancer Society of Malaysia, besides doing leading a young cancer survivors group, try to get us together at least once a month, which is really difficult, is um, patient advocacy and trying to let people know, hey, we are here. Don't feel afraid to join us or, you know, if your parents don't allow you, uh, you know, we will try to talk to them to allow you to join this group because this group will be able to help you and give you the confidence you need um, and to answer all the questions that you have. You know, I've, I've traveled all over the world and worked in mental health and I find this, first of all, two things. One, it's very inspiring. And secondly, it's not unique to Malaysia. You see this all over the world, these same challenges yeah. in diagnoses that have stigma like cancer and really human beings in the end we want this sense of community not yeah. to be alone and for patients to create that with the support of the healthcare team i want to get your final thoughts for our listeners coming back to you dr jennifer what's your advice to cancer patients that are going through a tremendous emotional mental health impact maybe to the degree of being diagnosed with depression or anxiety what's your message to them that you're not alone we know that it's tough to have to deal with the cancer. The diagnosis itself, as well as the treatment journey, is not easy. So you're brave. Come up, step up, and right. just, you know, seek for help early and, and speak to your oncologist about it. Do not be embarrassed. And um, there's, there's so much help these days. And just like Nisi has gone through, so go for a support group. I think the best kind of uh, uh, support that you can get are from the survivors group. Mm -hmm. yeah, because they can understand each other better. Absolutely. And I'm sure you've worked with some of these groups or maybe yes, got... and I have uh, my young patients mm -hmm. who is also undergoing the group. Yeah. And they've done tremendously well. And I'm very proud of what Dr. Chu has done. Yeah. Oh, Thank you. Well. Yeah. The young survivor. Dr. Chu, any final messages to our listeners or viewers? Um, I think, like, I think earlier echoing your thoughts, a cancer diagnosis is very difficult. Like for Dr. Jenny. Uh, Dr. Jennifer mentioned, her job is a really difficult one to break the news. So for those of you who have just been diagnosed with cancer, um, know that you're not alone. If you're a young cancer patient, do join us, um, the Young Cancer Survivors Group from the National Cancer Society of Malaysia. We're able to help you, give you the support that you need. 
and answer all the questions um, that you have. And I'm sure there are tons of questions. We even answer questions like, um, what supplements should I take? Which is very common in Malaysia. Or what food? Yeah, what can food I should I eat? eat? Yeah. Well, I can tell you from my visit to Malaysia that the food is <laughs> fantastic here. And But to echo what you're saying, uh, what's happening in Malaysia is happening all over the world. I, I think wherever our viewer or listener is from, they can find a local society to help them. And as you know, if you if you can't find one, what you did was very resourceful. You reached out to yeah. North American societies, and then you built something. And yeah. uh, there's nothing stopping anyone listening to do the same. Yes, I learned a lot from them, and I kind of uh, t- took the best practices there and applied it here. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. It's been an honor. I've been inspired, and I'm sure our listeners and viewers uh, feel the same. Thank you for your time. Thank you for the, all the tremendous work you're doing, and it's been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Mo. Thank you so much, Dr. Mo and Dr. Jennifer.